From Nashville's WSM Radio, the original home of the Grand Ole Opry, this is a Coffee, Country, and Cody podcast. All right, Charlie Mattis, you've put together Breland, Mark Wills, and Gordon Moat for this week's podcast episodes. A lot of fun. Uh, well, everybody in the room still smiling with Breland. I was out that day. Oh, yes. my gosh. I hate that you missed it because he is so much fun. <laughs> he is. You know, he's doing Breland and Friends. This yeah. is the third year for it. Overall, he's already raised $300,000 for the Oasis Center, which helps at-risk youth here in Tennessee. So this year, he announced all the lineup. It's going to be incredible. And it also kicks off his tour mm-hmm. for the summer. So A yeah. little more country A little more country Countryer. How and, about that? And who are you most excited to see on that lineup? You actually thought it was a typo that Josh I did not really Groban. write Josh Groban. You looked Josh at it like Groban. I thought it was Josh Grayson, and yeah. then you wrote it wrong. I know. I know what you were thinking because I have done that. <laughs> Josh Groban was just Sweeney Todd on yeah. Broadway, and we didn't get to see him. So now I am. I love Breland. I love everyone who's on this lineup. But when Josh Groban was at it, I was like, oh my gosh. That just nice reminded little. me of the best Loretta Lynn story. She was reading liners one time for. Uh, the guy was my first producer when I came here 30 years ago, Kevin Anderson. Oh, Kevin, yeah. And she was reading, and finally, at one point, she goes, Kevin. She didn't call him Kevin. She called him Kevin. She said, Kevin, hits wrote wrong. <laughs> when you said, hits Charlie, wrote wrong. You thought Charlie had written it wrong. That's hits right. wrote wrong. Well, yes. <laughs> you know you've worked for someone for a while when they can anticipate your mistakes. So, <laughs> uh, and Aaron, you got to meet Gordon Moat for the first time. I and, did. and hear the great Porter Wagner Oh, my gosh. <laughs> what an incredible impersonation. Just like you said, it was as if... He was in the room with us. Uh, and, of course, a, a Jacksonville, Alabama guy. We talked a little bit of Alabama history. He he said, roll tide on WSM, and nothing makes me happier. And what were <laughs> so all the Nashville little... connections to Jacksonville State? Jamie Johnson, Gordon, Riley Green, and I'm leaving somebody else. That, uh, you'll hear it mm-hmm. in the podcast that he wrote uh, 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 from uh, Fort Payne, Alabama, oh. and Randy Owen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. There you go. And then Mark Wills. What did we learn from Mark Wills? Well, his favorite chapstick, his flavor, Mm -hmm. is uh, Burt's Bees. Cucumber mint. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. I question that. I question that. I'm a vanilla bean guy. Cucumber mint. And he has his own line. He has Mark's Bees. And we all have them. He gave them to us all. Yeah. Mark's Bees. Mark's Mark's Bees. Bees. And he played the Super Bowl one time. What? Remember that (laughs) Oh, that's right. As a background singer at a Super Bowl years ago, we had no idea that that had taken place. And he tells it so beautifully. So that and lots more podcasts from Coffee, Country, and Cody. Mark Wills. Good morning. I saw you last at the Grand Ole Opry. Yeah, about 40 hours ago. But I understand that uh, we had an after party at the scoreboard across from the Grand Ole Opry House, from which you have just returned yeah. to the studio. I have not even been to bed yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we went last night. Man, last night was a great night at the Opry House. You know, such, a, such an amazing time. Cody Johnson brought a bunch of his friends. Kevin Fowler. You know, made his opera debut last night. Just uh, And Cody introduced him. Said, yeah. man, I was a 20-year-old kid. Went to see this guy. Yeah. I said, I want to do it like that. Yep. Yep. And so 17 years later, he's on the stage of the Grand Ole Opry. Amen. The night before, he's playing a sold-out Bridgestone Arena, introducing yeah. that guy that was such an inspiration to him, Absolutely. Kevin Fowler. Yeah. It, it was a it really was, sweet it, moment. It was a great evening. And my daughter, my youngest daughter, Macy, I mean, y'all, y'all all know mm-hmm. Macy, but uh, Macy's such a huge country music fan and, and dives so deep. Like, you know, I mean, she she knows album cuts off 1950s vinyl. Ooh. You know, I mean, she loves, she loves it. So uh, I'm on tonight and tomorrow night, and uh, and I told her I was going to Nashville, and she's like, oh, who's on the Opry this weekend? And I told her, and she's like, that sounds like a fun weekend. And then she backed, you know, like backdated one date, and she goes, and I'm going too. Oh. Because of last night, <laughs> Cody Johnson is there. So, yeah, so we went up, we come up and hung out with Cody, and uh, and I miss Trent Wilman, uh, uh, who you know I toured with. Trent has been producing Cody's records, yeah. and uh, and I missed. I saw him at a distance, but I didn't get to speak to him last night. So, good morning, Trent. How are you? Did you know Cody's story? Had you followed him along the way? Yeah, during the Texas years, of yeah, the red dirt thing, and absolutely. Well, he was blowing up, and they kept people from Nashville trying to get him to sign. He's like, nope, mm-hmm. nope, yeah. nope. Mm-hmm. And he's like, okay, you write down what you want, 
and sign it, and we'll honor that. I do that every day. I just can't find somebody to honor it. <laughs> you know? Every day. I'm like, I take my piece of paper, I slide it the table, and they go, yeah, no. And I'm like, okay, and I slide it back over, you know? But, yeah, I mean, I, th- that's, what I think, that's what I think the music industry is missing. It, it's people that, people that know who they are, know what they want to do, and won't sell their soul for you know for five minutes of fame and and i think that he is a true testament to somebody that just that just sort of came around you know and and everybody's got their story but i I truly believe that he's just one of those guys that he knew what he wanted to do and he was wise enough to watch the manipulation that sometimes goes on and he said no that's that's not who i am that's not what i want to do yeah and uh not unlike pat green yeah not unlike yeah. george Strait. Before. absolutely yeah. you know i mean we you and we could go on and on about guys like that 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 sort of have have sort of uh lined that pathway that that cody's walking now mm-hmm. but i think it's so good you know that that he's he's making the music that he wants to make uh he is he's doing the things he's doing it like he wants to do it and that's being recognized and people don't even realize that they're recognizing it that's what to me that's what that in you know in in our little world right here of us sitting around this table mm-hmm. that to me is what's beautiful about the whole thing. and i think too you know cody had he had the ten thousand hours he'd already put in the work yeah. going all around texas and so for people that feel like he's this big overnight sensation yeah. he's already done yeah. the work <laughs> the difference in watching somebody walk on stage that has done it multiple multiple times feeling confident feeling like i got you and we're going on a ride together right. versus somebody that's only done it a few times and they're nervous when they're nervous on stage it makes everybody who's watching feel yeah. nervous there's just a comfort factor with watching cody did y'all see the craig campbell thing where he talked about uh where he got naked and put no no, no. okay no, no different I, no, video I, Never watch. I never would watch. He that. did that. He did I know, that. I know. I know. <laughs> if y'all, there's a. There, he did a great clip about uh, about him and talking to a, a record label exec, and about how they signed this guy. It, it's it's a parody, but it's so funny. And and he he does this thing where he's like talking on both ends of the phone. He's playing both characters. Okay. And he does this thing, and he's like, "Yeah, we signed this kid. Gave him a huge signing bonus. Yeah, he's never even done a real show. <laughs> you know, and you need to watch it because it is it is like one of those things where I go, hey, man, brother, <laughs> somebody yes. said it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's great. It's, it's great. funny and also scary because it's true. It's true. Mm-hmm. My comment was, I and would that's, laugh, but that's this is I, this happens ninety nine point nine percent every day. It's not fair to the artist, and that's the thing that I keep seeing. It's like when when they put somebody in a position where you've set them up to fail because yeah. they don't have they don't it's have the job. legs yet. Yeah, this is a job. Yeah, and and people forget that this is a job. You know, we we joke and and, and it's entertainment. And the beautiful thing about it, like you know, like Bill last night, he he left and he said he was going home and going to bed. Some of us didn't do that. <laughs> Me, <laughs> you know, but 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 this is work. Yeah, and, and people need to treat the you know for people that come into this and think it's a one hundred percent constant party. It ain't. Well, here's the you beauty. Treat this like a joke. Kevin Fowler's fifty eight years old. Yeah, yes. and making his Grand Ole Opry debut in front <laughs> of cool. his. 82 and 80 year old mama and daddy sitting in the audience. I talked to him last night That's on the way out. What is just touches me Absolutely. as deeply as anything could at Absolutely. the Grand Ole Opry. Well, that's what I talked to him last night as we were on our way out. Because, you know, because so often as an Opry member, we go in and I'll go in and I'll see people that are there for the first time. And I always try to do what little Jimmy Dickens did for me or what Jim Ed Brown did for me or Bill Anderson or, Con, you know, Connie Smith. George or, Hamilton the fourth, Right, Jeannie Seeley. Mm-hmm. I always try to welcome those people. And all evening I would I would walk by Kevin's room and there was just a gaggle <laughs> of people around. And so I, I you know, I would, I would kind of peek in and I would, you know, I would see him in there, but, you know, he had people around him. So I never messed with him all evening. As we're, as we're on our way out, he's standing in the hallway and I just kind of pat him on the shoulder. And I said, man, congratulations on your debut. And he turns around and he goes, 
what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have even recognized you because I was dressed. Maybe I'm in the same thing I have. I think you are. But yeah, does it smell like? No, I'm, I'm Scoreboard? Okay. Yeah, it smells like the scoreboard. Like scoreboard. <laughs> um, but no, I, uh, you know, I, I, I talked to him there for a couple minutes. And, you know, and, and of course, you know, I, I got to go out front and, and watch some of the evening. I got to watch some of him on stage from, from front of house. Um, and that's, to me, that's the, that's one of the coolest things ever because so so often as entertainers, we see it from the stage or the side of the stage or your podium uh-huh. or right there at the curtain. You don't get the full effect of, of how beautiful the Opry house is, mm-hmm. of how warm it is when you are, when you're witnessing something for the first time. And that's the beautiful thing about the Opry is that it's always, it's always a different show. Mm -hmm. Even if you, even if they do two shows that night, it's, it's different. And so I got to go out and and really check that out. And, and, and it was a, it was a neat experience. And the new sound system sounds killer. I could give you you a visual analogy, but it is completely inappropriate. Uh, (laughs) I will tell you that the first time I ever heard it, uh, I went out front and Riders in the Sky oh. were on, and you know, you know, Jeff's up there, you know, playing the squeeze box. Mm-hmm. You could hear, and you could hear. This is what blew my mind: is sitting out front, you could hear the valves mm-hmm. opening on the accordion. That's how clear it was <laughs> in the house, you know. And I was like, oh yeah, you know, because that's perfect for bluegrass. It's perfect mm-hmm. for you know for their style of music, and, you know. And then you can put. Then you can put the 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 big sound of you know the the big bass and all that the country stuff in it and it and it just it it sounds so clear so good in the Opry House it's it's, it's amazing. One of the highlights of the conversation last night that Chuck Wicks had with Cody Johnson, yeah, who was talking about they had a they live in Madisonville, Texas, on a big ranch, mm-hmm. and their house had mold seventy eight hundred square foot house. That's right. So Ooh. they had to down to the studs, tear it down to the studs, and rebuild it. Mm-hmm. And he's living in a single wide trailer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he said, "I'm the only guy you knew I don't know who flew here in a private jet, but will fly home to a single wide trailer." <laughs> Hey, maybe not. <laughs> if that ain't country music, I don't know what is. You got a spare bedroom at your place, Mark? Yeah. Yeah. You might have a couple, you know? It's amazing when the kids move out how much extra room you have. <laughs> we are streaming all around on Circle Now at Peacock, Roku, Zumo, and so many other places that you can watch Coffee Country and Cody. And I'm certainly glad that you tuned in when you did because Breland is here! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 It's so good to see you. Uh, it's good to be here. It's yeah, good to we see you love guys. it. You come by and see us, and I feel like this is probably third, fourth time, maybe. Oh, I've been, I mean, oh. even I've, I've been on here even longer than that. Oh yeah, I've probably been, this might be he like was pre, six. He was pre Kelly. Yeah, he's been here <gasps> PK. Yeah, <laughs> I've been on here some times. I realize nothing I'm exists, sorry, PK. But, but uh, I'm it, did, sorry. it didn't count until now. But Thank what you. I, I will say that every time I've come here until now, I have taken some crazy route. And had to go through the entire hotel. Yeah, the whole <laughs> property. And this time, I actually got here the way that you guys. We were surprised. Designated. It's like wow. Look at this. I've come in here while you guys were like introducing me. Yeah. Sure. Like <laughs> running here, sweating. Like, all right, what are we talking about? <laughs> it's great that chairs on wheels because there I were know, times hey, that we put it there, uh, you got uh, in it, and look, slid all the way up. Honestly, so it's, it's good to be here. <laughs> it's so good to see you. Listen, you stay so busy, and it's so much fun to see you pop up in the most unexpected places. Most recently, when you were doing Super Bowl predictions, I'm like, I'm watching on like sports channels and all of a sudden they're like please welcome Breland and I'm going wait wait what hey. how did that all start um you know it started many many years ago when uh the Eagles were really good uh, and many moons as ago a, as a small child we just were consistently making it to the playoffs <laughs> consistently making it to the NFC championship game I thought it would always be like that right it wasn't uh <laughs> but at that point I was already locked in <laughs> And so I figured if if I'm going to suffer through another NFL playoffs, I might as well get some engagement out of it. Sure. And uh, it it made for some some fun content to just predict what I thought would happen in these games. And and honestly, over the course of the playoffs, I was 9-4. and So that's pretty solid. Solid, man. We have a clip of it. I pulled it so we could watch. All right, let's go. (laughs) 
asking for another rap. I was hating to before the pics I made in front of Pat. But if every time I do this, y'all keep running up the stats, then it's obvious <laughs> I can't run it back. These are my predictions. I got Travis catching passes for at least 89. And he's taking one all the way. I'm predicting young and boss to get my homes on the move. The Niners got a lot to prove. They almost lost the championship. I know they found a way. Yeah. Let's go. Like, it's so good. I don't even like mm. football, but I like it now. <laughs> That's so fun. As a former sportscaster, I need to know if you have any aspirations to be a color commentator or a play-by-play at some Look, point. Let's go. I, it's definitely something that I can do. Uh, and mm-hmm. when I watch games, I'll turn it on mute and just sit there and be like, and I could do this for multiple sports. There's probably four or five sports that I think if you gave me a microphone and just let me call what it was that I was seeing. I could do it for a bunch of sports. My (laughs) wife says every event we go to, I do it in my head. And she can see me mouthing along. Because it's all I've ever done until I came here. How many years did you do Vanderbilt? I had 29 years at Vanderbilt doing basketball stuff. Yeah. Okay, so So, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So do you remember the vet or you only Lincoln Financial Field? I do remember the vet. My (laughs) my first first season or two watching, uh, we were still at the vet. And then we moved over to Lincoln. And the Spectrum? Yeah. Yeah. Same same thing. When I was a kid, it was called the... um, the Wachovia Center, right? Okay, and then it then it yeah. turned into Wells Fargo. Yeah. So, mm. I've been I've been around. Yeah. I love the fact that you are following sports in that. So, what is one sport you feel comfortable? Like they said, hey, the entire broadcast team came down with E. coli. They're out. Mm-hmm. So you got to step in. <laughs> wow. <what is laughs> Why did I go there? I, know, I don't that know. Was like That's dark. very two thousand nine. Couldn't just have, you. Couldn't just have the flu. Or? <laughs> right. Yeah. It, it was very specific. Yeah. So you're stepping in. What is your like? This is my A game. I'm ready. Put me in coach. What would be the first sport? Would it be football? Would it be probably basketball? Would basketball. be the okay. easiest one. Okay. The the sneaky one that people don't know I could do is tennis. I watch a lot. Of, tennis oh, is my oh, most watched oh. sport. Really? Over the last two years. Do you play? Um, I do casually play. Okay. I'm not definitely not that good. Uh, I've had a chance to kick it and connect with a few different tennis players that has kind of like opened my eyes to how dope the sport is. What I love about tennis that the other sports don't have is that it is like one-on-one. So there's so many real life applications Mm -hmm. because there's very little coaching. You're just kind of out there and it's really you versus yourself. You know, Mm. the the talent level between the best player in the world and the hundredth best player in the world is pretty minimal, but it's the mindset and the mentality that they come into the match with that allows them to overcome whatever obstacles they face. And I feel like that's there's so many life lessons in that. That's beautiful. So I, if you wanted me to to commentate a tennis match, also you don't have to talk a whole lot in tennis. You that's could just true. let you oh. can let whole points go by. Yeah. yeah. And then eventually be like, well, that was a shot there, and you know, and then <laughs> <laughs> come back out. You don't have to say anything. What an that's ace. easy. Basketball yeah. play by play oh. requires a lot more attention. Oh, setting the screen. He's going to the basket, and he's you know like takes a little more. I love this. You know, the beauty of tennis, too, is you only really ever see the main court with, like, the 15,000 people. Sure. But there are games, matches on, like, 13 other courts. Oh, and yeah. literally, if you go to one of the side courts, you're as close to, like, Yvonne Lendl or Jimmy yeah, Connors insane. back in the day as I am to Breland. It's it's insane oh, no, how it's... intimate it becomes. Ooh. Yeah, you go from, like, 20,000 people watching you to, like, 80 people watching you. No, yeah. it's it gets yeah. really intimate. And it's so quiet that everyone mm-hmm. is kind of just sitting. and. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that. It's a cool so. sport. If, it reminds me a lot of what it is that I do, you know, going out onto a stage. And it is kind of just me versus me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's a perfect segue into Breland and Friends. Very first year, you come out and you're like, I'm going to do this thing. It's going to be at the Ryman. I'm just going to see who shows up. And everybody shows up. I remember I was there and I was crying. I can admit Aww. he knows. I was like, look she at was there and I, she was crying. I was crying. I was there so happy because it made me feel like, oh my gosh, this is exactly where you belong and that you are like this great connector. And I've told you that before. I feel like that everybody feels connected to you the minute that they meet you. So then you come back the next year and the next year. So we're heading into year three now yeah. of Breland and Friends. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like, okay, i got to top the past two years? Or is it just the same, like, let's just open it up and figure it out and who comes, whoever yeah, wants to come? I think the, the benefit of Breland and Friends that most of my other shows don't have is that it's not about me at all. Like, <laughs> And it's not even really even about the people who are in the room. Like, yeah. it's, it's a charitable <laughs> event, you know? So it takes a lot of the pressure off i think uh, in terms of the performance aspect because even if i didn't play my absolute best show there's going to be 10 to 15 other artists that can help 
you know, kind of pick up the slack and we're, we're raising money. So it's not even about us in the first place. But yeah. for those who haven't been, if you just look at the lineup, it's like, oh, that's a pretty impressive lineup. Oh, I yeah. want to go see this. But what they don't realize is you're just not bringing them on. You're like performing. With, yeah, these are, so it's th all duets. This is like an incredible amount of effort <laughs> yeah. for a one night. Oh, you know? yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. It, I will say like of all the shows that we do, like it's pretty easy to like almost, you know, if we play a bunch of shows in a row, you can almost end up unfortunately being on autopilot sometimes because sure. you're playing the same exact songs night in and night out. The set list doesn't often change when you're on the road. If you're opening for someone, especially, you know, on the Shania tour, we had 30 minutes or 35 minutes. So it's the same set list for you know 20 plus dates mm -hmm. like you kind of just get into a zone yeah. with Breland and friends you're constantly on your toes because you're playing a bunch of songs you haven't performed before with artists that right. you might have only met for the first time during sound check and maybe you didn't even get a chance to sound check mm -hmm. with them and you know so it is kind of like live theater improv to it to a certain extent adrenaline which I, I think is a lot of fun yeah you, know, you can tell how much you love it you oh, your whole dude. face lights and up I get when to you wear, talk about and it. I get to like wear my host hat too and yes. I get to kind of come in and, and be the master of ceremonies which is also fun you know getting a oh, we like to, it. To we like it a lot. You know, and, and also like, you know. Don't each, get too good at yeah, it. Yeah, this is our only skill. <laughs> like, hey, it's, it's, it's all we do. There's enough to, there's enough to go around, y'all. So <laughs> it's going to be happening March 26th, uh, Breland and Friends. It's going to be at the Ryman again. And you are about to drop some of the names. Come on. So this is the major announcement. Here we go. Are we ready? Yeah. Tell us who will be on stage with you at Breland and Friends this year. All right. I mean, y'all. Y'all are hearing this for the first time. This Whoop! is an exclusive. Should we drum roll? Should drum we drum roll? Yeah, give it to me. Okay, okay. Give me a little drum roll. Okay, there it is. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. So we've got Matt Stell coming out. Oh, we've got Dylan Marlowe coming out. Oh, okay. We've got pop R&B hip hop sensation Quinn 92 popping out. Yeah. We've got Southern soul legend Anthony Hamilton oh, coming out. Yeah. Oh, are you yeah. kidding? It's range. Oh, he's range. gonna bring down the house. Oh, I already know. And this is already in addition to some of the other people that you've announced. We got Avriana that's gonna be there, Caitlin Smith, Chase Rice, Dalton Dover, Drake White. Am I reading Josh Groban? Correct. Yeah. Am I reading Josh Groban? Josh Groban will be there. Did Mr. I just Sweeney see? I knew you would. <laughs> Josh was like. I knew you would be excited. I literally had to like pause for a second. Wait a minute. He just wrapped up Sweeney Todd like yeah. two weeks ago. Uh -huh. Correct. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And I, and I got a chance. He brought me out to, to come see him. We played uh, Madison Square Garden with Shania and Josh was there and we had sung together a couple years ago for something that we were doing on PBS and I popped in uh, to his suite and we were, tr you know, talking and ah. he was like, Hey, like I saw that you were doing Breland and friends. Like, that's so cool. Like I want to do it. And I was like, oh. 2024, let's go. Like I want, I want your mm -hmm. Breland and friends. And he's like, okay, well, you know, we're, we're wrapping up Sweeney Todd. And I was like, I was like, Oh yeah, you're, you're on Broadway right now. He was like, yeah. He's like, you want to come to the show tomorrow night? Yes, I was I like, yeah. So his guests that night, and this is just maybe a, a, do it. his guests that night, it's, it, you know, I'm there. I bring a plus one. And he's got Brian Cranston there oh. with, with, with Brian with his wife, and we're all just sitting next to each other. And Brian's just taking on, you know, taking on this like dad role. And he's like, he's like, you need to be in bed by midnight. You've got a show tomorrow night, and say wherever. I was like, yo, what's oh going on God. right now? So I, I'm very excited to have to have Josh. He crushed it on Broadway, yes, and I did. imagine he'll crush it off Broadway. Oh. From one Broadway to the next. You feel me? And this is the incomparable Gordon Moat. <laughs> joining us this morning. Man, morning. I'm so glad to see you come through that door. What a pitiful way to celebrate your 44th wedding anniversary. <laughs> oh, no. Pitiful. <laughs> That's what Vince said that to me one night. It was like our 25th or something, yeah. and I took Rebecca to the Opry. And, and I said, hey, Vince, I want you to, and I don't, I don't, maybe they hadn't met at that point in time. But anyway, uh, I introduced him, told him it was our wedding anniversary, and he said something very, very similar. Man, that is pitiful. <laughs> yeah. Bringing her to the Grand Ole Take Opry. her somewhere to eat, at least. <laughs> Get her an Opry dog and a goo-goo cluster. <laughs> the day is still young. Bill yeah. still has time to redeem himself. I guess so. <laughs> and certainly we're going to talk about your music, new music, and the new album. The album's called Where You Lead Me, but you were yeah. just off the air, coincidentally. We played Vince Gill a little earlier. You yeah. said you've been in the studio with Vince a lot. Yeah, lately. last year we spent uh, a couple of weeks, two and a half weeks uh making some music uh, some new music with Vinny and uh mm -hmm. it's always such a pleasure to work with him I always feel like I'm skipping school you know uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> a good description you know? of going over there because oh we we God. just make it's just happened so um organically you know it's uh 
you know, uh, and there's so many ways to make music. And in today's world, uh, we go in the studio uh, because I'm still very fortunate to get to play on a lot of records and work with a lot of producers, uh, the ones that are, you know, established and then the, the young and, you know, upcoming, you know, kind of uh, the ones that are coming up. But, uh, you know, you have they have an idea. They have a roadmap. They have a demo. And they really kind of have an idea of how they want you to do it. And you, you can kind of veer off from time to time but for the most part there are stems you know there are already some tracks you're going to play to in many cases and so with vince it was just he played his guitar he sang us a song we kind of went put our headphones on got behind our instruments and it kind of just came together and you had this incredible you know it was uh, just some incredible players that i respect so much you know uh, it's hard to mess up when you've got guys like Tom Bukovec and Paul Franklin and <laughs> Fred Eltringham. You know, how do you uh, – John Jarvis and I were both there playing keys. Oh, wow. Vince was playing. Uh, Jed Hughes was playing. I mean, Jimmy Lee Slos. It's kind of kind of hard to kind of mess that up. We all have such respect for each other. So it was – and Vince is just singing and playing, and it's just an emotional thing when Vince sings anything. He could sing Mary Had a Little Lamb and – you'd want to go to the altar and get your life changed. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Rededicate your life. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Try to do better. <laughs> Three or four times at least. Yeah. So have you seen the Eagles show with Vince? Live? I have not seen an Eagles show. My wife is very upset with me that we haven't gone to an Eagles show, but I did buy her James Taylor tickets last week. Well, okay. I, well I know for a fact you took it to the uh, Songwriters Hall of Fame gala. <laughs> yes. I, I yes. worked that night too. <laughs> yes. Well, yes, you did. It seems like we see each other a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> at these things but yeah carol ann ford and mark ford uh the the uh they they do they do such a great job with that and we went to church with them back in the day and kimberly still has a ladies group with carol ann and so uh i got roped into doing that on both sides uh, <laughs> <laughs> and tell folks what you did that night well we i, I produced uh, a couple of songs on the gatlins and mm -hmm. he wanted to debut this tune that we uh it's called uh, The Right Three Minutes, which I think is a brilliant song. Larry is just, he just gets better and better with his thoughts and his ideas. And, and it's amazing what The Right Three Minutes can do. Yes, right? That's a it's guy. a great hook. And so we got in the studio and I got to produce a couple songs on them. And he wanted to debut it that night. And then while I was there, they said, well, do you think you could play with uh, John Conley? <laughs> Lady Lay Down. I said, well, sure, sure I can if John wants me to. And uh, so we <laughs> went back there. And I met with John, and I said, John, it's good to see you. And uh, I said, uh, do you want to do it about the same tempo as the record? Do you want to? Yep, going to do it about the same way, you know. So, <laughs> so, so we went out there, and I started the intro, and it was a, too many times, you know. <laughs> I left the door wide open. <laughs> it was just a, so I told him, I said, John, I said, man, you're singing better than ever. I said, you're amazing. I said, that, your voice hadn't changed in years. And he said, oh, people tell me that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he's listening this morning. <laughs> oh, I just goodness. love him. I just oh, love him. We it's all so adore him. Oh, he's he, the best. He is so laid back and he's so the best. normal. I, I mean, know. He's just he, so he normal. Is, he is every man in a business where <laughs> he oh, is. isn't that way. And I look for him to have a, you know, a, a, I wish you'd do it this way or wish you'd do it that way. It like, no, he loved it. He loved it all. He's just so easygoing and just, he's a professional, man. He just, you know. He's that guy that just uh, never – doesn't matter what the audience is. It doesn't matter what the surroundings are. He just walks out there and sings. He told yeah, me one night late. backstage at the opera we were talking about somebody being so nervous before they go out that it kind of takes them out of their game for the first mm -hmm. couple of songs. They were a newcomer. And he looked at me and he said – and I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. I feel sorry for people to go through that. Mm-hmm. I, I don't experience that. Yeah. It's just what you wow. described. It just feels natural. Coach yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. It's like being in the studio. You know, some of these young kids, musicians. I mean, I was the young guy at one point, And we all want to just make them feel as at home as we can and as calm as we can because this is their big shot. Yeah. Right. You know, or maybe they're young and they've played on a few things. But, you know, they, they just want to do the right thing. They want to impress the producer. They want to impress the artist. And they want to be part of the family. Well, they want to make everybody happy. Yeah. Sure. yeah. They just want, and, so and, you just got to make sure they're as calm as they can be so they can do their best job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gordon, you've worked. We, we, we've talked about all the people you've worked with. The Gatlins, Vince, and you off air, we were talking about something you just cut with Kane Brown. Speaking of the, the new up-and-comers that you're working with, what do you listen for or what have you heard over the years that has been consistent with the folks that 
become superstars? The song. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's all about the song. You know, we're cutting, uh, we're working on a Christmas thing right now with Dan and Shay. And I've worked with them since the beginning of their career. And, you know, in order to bust wide open like they did, you got to have a song. And, uh, you know, this, we may be streaming instead of listening on physical, uh, you know, physical product. Mm -hmm. Everything, so much has changed. But the fact still remains, if you want to be a household name, you've got to have the song. Mm-hmm. I'm just sitting here thinking about you going out with Alabama these days. Yeah. And old Tony Kang over Tony at the King. Grand Ole Opry. Yes, sir. What and, a singer and guitar player he is, man. And uh, one of my favorites, I, if I had to pick an album, just off the top of my head, you say, what's your favorite Alabama song? It's that great piano intro. I don't know who played it on the record. You will know, Gordon, but you get to play it. I guess they still do it in the shows. Old Flame. Willie Rainsford. Oh, okay. Willie Rainsford played it that. And, yeah, we do it. Mac McAdally wrote it. Yes, sir. I mean, and Mac. Man, uh, Mac is the best, greatest storyteller. I love Mac so much. Uh, we were cutting uh, three years ago, or two three years ago. We were in the shoals for a couple of days or three days cutting Ann Wilson, you know, the group Heart. Oh, yeah. And oh, so yeah. we were cutting some sides on Ann Wilson in the shoals, and then we came back to Nashville and cut some more. Anyway, I called Mac. I said, Mac, I'm in the shows, man. Let's have breakfast tomorrow morning. He said, dude, I'm in Nashville. I'm not in the shows. Oh. Man, I wish I could. I said, well, dude, that's not my problem. That's your problem. I'll see you in the morning. Uh, <laughs> I told him when we were at the Marriott, and I said, man, I got this good breakfast. And we laughed and hung up, and I thought, well, that's too bad. I'm not going to get to see Mac. About 7.30 in the morning, I'm having my coffee. He calls me up on my cell, and he goes, what room are you in? I wow. said, I'm in blah, 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 blah. He said, I'm fixing to come get you. I'm here. Oh. And he came just to have breakfast with us, me and Tony Lacito and Tom Bukovic. We went down and talked to him for three hours. It was like we were he was teaching school. He was holding court. But Listen, it was so fun. When you write, there's an old flame burning in your eyes. Randy's still singing better than ever. And Teddy's oh, right? singing and playing better than ever. The tears can't drown and makeup can't disguise. disguise. Goodness gracious. Yeah. I was telling Aaron Cooper, uh, who was meeting Gordon for the first time this morning, that I said, uh, well, not only multi-talented, two-time ACM award winner, but uh, the there are people who can imitate people. And then there are people who almost transform themselves into it. And I said, this will be like you are meeting Porter Wagner. It's that good. So would you please, Gordon, if you don't mind, tell the story of the Opry is sold out. You have family coming into town (laughs) and and Porter is helping you get tickets to a show that there are no tickets for. (laughs) First of all... uh let me say that my coffee cup is empty. <laughs> and uh, it's hard to tell the story this early in the morning without coffee in my cup. It's supposed to be coffee country, Cody, <laughs> and the coffee's missing. And I ain't heard much country <laughs> lately on the Nashville radio. And uh, But uh, all that aside, uh, we're going to take uh, – that's true. I – Gordon called me, said said uh, said he forgot to get tickets uh, for his f- family, <laughs> and so I told him. I told him. I said, "I help you out because I don't want you to have to sleep outside." You know, <laughs> it was cold back in those days where we was doing the rhyming. You know, back in the winter time, we'd take it from the the new house and take it down back to the old house, and. Uh, but I, I called uh, called the opera and said uh, said uh, said this Porter Wagner, and uh, I need to get this taken care of. Well, it did. I, and I uh, called Gordon back. Gordon said, "How'd you do it, Porter?" I said, "Well, it's easy. I just said hello. <laughs> it's Porter Wagner, and I need four tickets uh, for the show tonight." And the lady on the phone said, "Porter, wish he could help you, but..." Uh, we sold out. We don't got no more tickets. I said, you mean if the president of the United States was to call you up and say he needed four tickets, you wouldn't have four tickets to give him? She said, well, I imagine if the president was to call, well, we could probably find some tickets. I said, well, he ain't calling. Give me his four. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's a true story. Oh, my gosh. Thanks for listening to the Coffee, Country, and Cody podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please leave us a five-star review. This podcast was produced through the facilities of WSM Radio in Nashville, Tennessee. The hosts of Coffee, Country, and Cody are Bill Cody, Charlie Matos, and Kelly Sutton. Producer, Eric Markham. WSM General Manager and Director of Content and Programming, J. Patrick Tittle. Copyright 2023. Opry Entertainment Group Holdings, LLC.